Ukraine has been in the news a lot recently. Since late February, when the war began, we at Dog Podcast Network have been looking at the impact it has on the dogs. Today, a special report on that. is no longer the safe place you imagine. Ukraine is under full-scale Russian assault. No one is coming to defend Ukraine. Tens of thousands have tried to flee. Civilian casualties. Seems reminiscent of the Second World War. Explosions. A missile strike. Fight to the end. Air raid sirens. A helicopter assault. Shock Russian missiles. Intense fighting. I cannot believe it's happening, really. Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Claire Mansell in Ottawa, Canada. Welcome to Dog Edition. Where voices from around the world consider all things dog. Dog Edition is the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. Today on the show, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine at the forefront of many of our minds, we look at how it's impacted dog owners there, what it's been like for the people and pets who left Ukraine in search of refuge, and those who have not. It's an important episode, so if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's take a walk. Hey Pepper, wanna go for a walk? On February 24th of 2022, Russia sent in troops to invade Ukraine. The United Nations Secretary General has begged Russia to withdraw its troops in the name of humanity. It didn't take long for civilians to leave their homes and country in search of refuge. The United Nations quickly predicted the war would create the worst refugee crisis in Europe since the Second World War. According to the UN's refugee agency, nearly six million Ukrainians have now fled their nation. Among them are pet owners faced with the real dilemma of what to do with their animals. Do they bring them along on an uncertain journey, not knowing whether they'll be able to be properly cared for, or do they leave them behind? Photos and videos from border crossings around Ukraine show that many chose to bring their four-legged companions with them. So, we spoke with some of the people who provided them with some of the help that they needed along the way. Many of the folks that came across had to leave their pets behind, and that's kind of one of the tragedies of this war. So, probably 10% of the folks uh, had pets, but at least 50% of the folks owned pets. They need food, they need uh, basic drugs, like non steroid uh, anti inflammatories, and some basic antibiotics and some materials. Ukraine is not a rabies free country, so those pets coming across the border need to be isolated for 21 days. Where are those pets going to be isolated to test negative for rabies? I had at 1.34 cats and 17 dogs from Ukraine. Many people who left Ukraine with their pets crossed into a neighboring country like Poland or Romania or Moldova. We worked together to set up this border station in a tent right where the folks are crossing into Romania and they've just left the ferry boat that has crossed the Danube River. That's Dr. John Geller. He's a veterinarian and the founder and medical director of the Street Dog Coalition, a Colorado-based organisation that provides free care to the pets of people experiencing homelessness. A few days after the war began, he made an amazing decision. He decided he wanted to help. And after discussing it with his family, he flew to Romania, where he didn't yet know anybody, in order to try and help with the situation with pets out there. It's amazing. He did call some veterinarians in Romania ahead of time who told him, come on over, we need your help. This border station is about 10 miles from the nearest town, so really it's just a couple of buildings with officials and a ferry boat that goes back and forth across the river. And I, I got there at night. But what had happened was a kind of Olympic-style international village had sprung up at this border station and there was all kinds of services there, of course, starting with basic things like the Red Cross and medical care, but also lots of uh, free food and coffee. And there was a huge warming tent where people could get warm. And uh, I saw people 
just pulling their suitcases and their kids and their pets, and it was mostly mostly women and children, up this uh, ramp after getting off the ferry. Dr. Geller spent 12 days there giving free care in a makeshift clinic. The border guys who became very good friends with gave us a pretty large tent. I would say it was 20 foot by 20 foot. It was uh, held up with air pressure, with pneumatic tubing. And it was big enough for us to set up a nice little, almost like a little mobile clinic there. The local veterinarians, who I was basically working under their license, provided us a stainless steel table for treatments. We had a refrigerator for vaccines. We set up a little table and some chairs to create kind of a desk. We had some chairs for a waiting room. We had heaters. We had lights. We went. We worked uh, well into the night. It was really cold when I first got there. Now it's actually almost too hot, but it was this uh, a large blue tent that we did all our work in. That doesn't sound like a bad veterinary clinic. Imagine putting that together so quickly. Absolutely. And they did manage to see quite a lot of pets in that time. Over the 12 days, they saw about 250 different animals. And it was mostly cats and dogs, as you would expect, but also a handful of other pets, including a rat, a guinea pig, and even a turtle. He was far from the front, so most of the pets weren't coming in from a war zone. And the team didn't really see any major injuries or traumatic injuries on either the owners or the pets. I was really impressed with actually how good they looked and how well cared for they were. Although, surprisingly, many had never, ever been vaccinated in their lives or had had any veterinary care. But Ukraine people really seem to care about their pets. And it is that lack of vaccination that became the number one problem to resolve before Ukrainian pets could move on through to the rest of Europe towards wherever their final destinations might be. We had to do two things. One was provide them with a European Union pet passport so they could travel out of Romania because the borders are actually pretty tightly controlled in, in relation to crossing with pets. And the government keeps track of, of all the pets in the European Union using microchips that we implanted in every single pet. And the government keeps track of those microchip numbers. We also made sure we rabies vaccinated every pet. We gave them other vaccines and we had to do parasite protection as well. Doing these vaccinations was particularly challenging and the paperwork associated with them because every consultation required a constant back and forth translation of Ukrainian, Romanian and English. Mm. The fact that Ukraine is not a rabies free country put even more pressure on owners having this pet passport. And rabies, as you probably already know, is a deadly virus and it infects the central nervous system of its hosts and it can be transferred to humans. According to the CDC, the symptoms of rabies in humans include cerebral dysfunction, anxiety, confusion, agitation, delirium, hallucinations, fear of water, and eventually death. But rabies is preventable with appropriate medical care. Pets can be vaccinated against it. And if humans are exposed, they can undergo a vaccine regime to prevent rabies from developing. In the US, the most commonly affected animals are wild ones, raccoons, skunks, bats and foxes. But rabies in dogs is still common in many other countries. And that is why there's such an emphasis on documentation of pets coming from Ukraine, which is not a rabies-free country. And without the paperwork to prove their pets have been immunised against rabies, there's no guarantee that they will be allowed through into another mm. country. This is a problem that refugees can run into even thousands of miles away here in North America. In April, the New York Times reported that some Ukrainians were forced to leave their dogs in Mexico as they were crossing into the United States. I cannot imagine what kind of decision that must have been for those poor people, horrendous. They've come this far, and the last step yeah. into the U.S., they couldn't make it. Yeah. Despite the risk, Dr. Geller says that half of the pet owners who crossed into Romania where he was working did not stop to get the paperwork. Oh, it's going to break your heart. That is Dr. Marty Becker. He practices in the Ohio Panhandle, and is the founder of Fear Free, an organization that provides education to veterinarians and pet owners to look after a pet's physical and emotional well-being. He purchased his ticket to Romania without telling his wife. I'm pretty 
I could do things pretty impromptu in my life, which has got me in trouble over the years. Some people have said I'm ready, fire, aim. <laughs> this might be a good example. Well, there have been some incredibly supportive uh, families back home as well who've been left to pick up the pieces after these uh, wonderful volunteers have gone over to Europe. So I think it's important to recognise them as well. Dr. Becker says he went there to work on the big picture, look for unmet needs like where and how to quarantine pets so they have time to test negative for rabies because it takes 21 days for a dog to be considered fully immunised after having received the rabies vaccine. So it's not something you can just quickly get as you cross the border. They do need to be vaccinated and isolated and then test negative for rabies before they can be allowed to travel on. As it happens, while he was in Romania, Dr. Becker also visited the border crossing set up by Dr. Keller. And I saw a lady that was a breeder of Jack Russell Terriers. She had 10 of them. And the only way I could describe it, you know, you see pictures of Mexican banditos or something with bandoliers of bullets across them, you know, on an X. She had like bandoliers of Jack Russell Terriers on her. They were, they were attached all over her body. It would have looked funny, but it wasn't funny. Uh, She had a couple more, three or four more on a leash, probably had six on her body, two on two different leashes. She had a rope tied around her waist, pulling a wagon. And that wagon was the food and the medical supplies for those 10 dogs. She had nothing for herself, nothing, nothing to eat, nothing for sanitary needs. Wow, that's quite a um, arresting image there. He says... It was frigid and she wasn't even wearing shoes. Saw a guy coming across the ferry in a wheelchair. Elderly man. Didn't look well. Talked to him through an interpreter. His town was being bombed and bombs hit his apartment and he threw himself over his cats, elderly cats, to protect them. He took the shrapnel on his back, but his cats were fine. And he was so happy that his cats had made it to safety. Mm. There are countless stories like this. Romania, of course, is not a very wealthy country, but Ukrainian refugees are being met with nothing but generosity, despite the logistical costs of moving people and pets. Gasoline, diesel, or regular is $10 a gallon over there. And it's $10 a gallon in Moldova. So $4,000 per capita income with $10 a gallon gas? Uh, Yet these people are giving, they're opening up their hearts and homes and their wallets and their time and everything to help these people. So far, we've heard from Americans who've gone to Europe to help Ukrainian refugees and their pets. After the break, we'll hear from two local women who are providing care. We'll also share some resources with you. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Oh, every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. Oh, I want to run. I want to sniff. Ooh, I want to find a good stick to carry. Oh, I want to roll in the grass. Oh, and warm my belly in the sun. Oh, I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want ever pop. The green, glassy beef liver smell wakes my senses. Oh, you may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy. It infuses any food you give me with healthy life vibrancy. Oh, I can feel it. Ever pup traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. I'm so grateful to be your dog. And for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Ever pup, every day. Welcome back to Dog Edition. In the early days of the Russian invasion, Romania paused all the usual travel requirements for pets coming from Ukraine. 
you could walk through with your animal. You didn't need to have any documents. You didn't need to have anything. Elisa Dumitrescu. She told us to call her Elisa. Runs a shelter called Saved by the Vet in Solka, Romania, which is about 40 minutes away from the border with Ukraine. Elisa was born in Romania, but she moved to the U.S. when she was six years old. My father was a refugee in 84, and my mother, my sister, and I followed in 86 before the revolution here. And I grew up in and around New York. And in 2013, Elisa moved back to Romania. Well, I started Blueberry Farm with my husband, and that's what we do. But we noticed that there were so many homeless animals, and we just started building pens and taking them in. And that's how the, all of this started, basically. And now it's what I do basically every day. Mm. When the war started, her in-laws harbored people and she offered a safe haven for pets. Very few people actually stay here. They spend one night or a few nights or a week at most, and then they move on further on into Europe. The Save by the Vet shelter helped people get the vaccines and documentation that they needed to bring their pets along to other countries. We had one dog that was injured that came through. She actually got injured at the border. She had to undergo surgery here. And her people, the day right after surgery, her people took her with them onwards to Germany. They didn't want to leave her. They took her antibiotics and treatments with her. I mean, she was fresh out of surgery. She'd been mauled by another dog, actually, at the border. And, um, yeah, they just kept on going with her. I haven't had anyone leave their animals, like their pets with me. The determination for people to stay with their animals is incredible. Mm -hmm. As the war continued, Romania reinstated its travel requirements on pets coming from Ukraine. Elisa says the amount of animals coming through now is negligible compared to what it was at the beginning. I think what's happening now at the border, people are taking their animals with them and when they realize they can't cross with them or they don't, they don't have necessary paperwork, they leave them. And the animals are just left to their own kind of devices, unfortunately. There are groups at the border here, near the border crossing where I live, that are helping, you know, if animals do come across the border or they find stray animals, they do help them. But it's, I, I think that's what's happening with people who can't uh, get their animals across, unfortunately. Mm. And the flow of Ukrainian dogs into Europe without proper paperwork has had a negative repercussion on the Save by the Vet shelter. The dogs Elisa normally rescues in times of peace are adopted by people in the UK or other countries in Western Europe, but that's no longer the case. What happened, because people were falsifying documents, other rescues were falsifying documents in trying to move Ukrainian animals out of the country when they should undergo quarantine and they need full vaccination papers, the UK government decided to close its borders to animals from Romania, from Poland, from Belarus, and from Ukraine. That's bad news for our own local rescues because we need to have animals adopted in order to make space for new animals that we rescue. And we rescue a lot, unfortunately. People dump mothers, pregnant mothers, mothers and puppies, puppies by themselves. They dump them all the time. In the last few weeks, they've taken in seven mothers and they're 31 puppies. Wow. Even as her shelter is getting crowded... Elisa is doing what she can for animals still in Ukraine. We do supply runs, dog and cat food runs into Ukraine. We were doing our sixth today. There's a shelter in Chernivtsi that we supply with food and they ferry it onwards to Kiev and other areas that need help with food for animals. So far, we've heard about the painful process of refugees traveling with their pets. But what about the people who stayed in Ukraine? In Kyiv, Dr. Elena Kuschuk stayed behind to provide care for the animals of the people who didn't leave. I feel I just can sit and wait what is what will go on. I have to do something. And maybe it looks like some uh, heroism, but it's not really because... I, I decided that I just lose my mind in case I do not work. She says the first day was unbearable. First day, while I was at home with my family, and it was all the time with this sound of, of explosions, the rockets, and after one day of this sound, you just understand that you can't stay at one place when you hear all this. So on the second day of the war, 
She sent her family to Western Ukraine, and she moved into her veterinary clinic in Kyiv. She says it's a massive older building. Very thick walls, and uh, we didn't hear anything. She slept in the basement of her clinic for several weeks. All these two months, uh, staying in the clinic all the day and all the night, I didn't hear this sound, and I think it's uh, saved my brain. Dr. Kuschuk says her friends have gotten used to it and they can differentiate whether the sounds are incoming from a Russian attack or outgoing from the Ukrainian military and are even starting to joke about it. Mm. It's one joke when you are at night and together with your husband, for example, and some sound and the wife is wake up and, oh, just, what is that? Oh, just do not worry, it's ours. As in, don't worry, honey. The sound of an explosion was made by our Ukrainian rockets, not the Russians. Wow. However, Dr. Kustryk says she's not desensitized to the sound of explosions and rockets. I hope I never differentiate them. Defense or attack. I just don't, don't want to know. I just want this stop and Russians go back. Dr. Kostchuk says the situation in her clinic has changed from week to week. Most few weeks, we couldn't get any supply from our usual uh, roads, let's say. And uh, our colleagues from Poland and Czech Republic, they help, help us a lot. Now we still uh, have some difficulties, uh, but now a lot of um, supplements we're receiving from um, our usual road. And I really, really appreciate for my colleagues from Poland and Czech Republic uh, for supplies sent it actually first weeks. They, I don't know how, but they found the way and we get supply uh, direct into clinic. In the first few days of the war, they didn't have much work because, unsurprisingly, people didn't realize that the clinic was still open. Those people have a lot of clients who has dogs with injuries and cats with problems, which was, let's say, caused by stress. For example, um, pancreatitis, uh, gastrointestinal disease, and uh, cystitis, and so on. Wow, I can understand where the pets would be under a lot of stress. Absolutely, and you can only imagine how the humans are feeling as well. As news spread that the clinic was still open, more people brought in their pets, and sadly, some of them had been severely injured. We did a lot of amputation. Unfortunately, uh, because of shots and because of uh, shrapnels. And we have some cats, which was saved uh, from the buildings, destroyed buildings. So crash traumas. She is one of three veterinarians who practices internal medicine at the clinic. And currently, sometimes she sees 20 or 25 dogs a day. But she's not alone in the clinic. Now we have ICU with four different uh, doctors there. Uh, We have three internal medicine specialists, two specialists with, let's say, who who did ultrasound and uh, different exams. And a lot of our um, colleagues with uh, specialties are going to come back. She's no longer sleeping and living in the clinic all the time. She's moved back to her place with her cat, but colleagues from a Kiev suburb continue to live in the clinic. Dr. Kostruk says that the weeks she spent living there were actually good for her mental health. It it saved me because I worked and I didn't think about what is going on outside. She says she's grateful for all the help that she's been given. I really want to thank you for all support that I received in the first weeks of war. From, from colleagues, I actually, I didn't know even that colleagues from Europe and in America. And they helped my friends. They send us supplies. They send us, uh, let's say, greetings and support. And I feel that you worry. And I really appreciate it for that. And I believe everything not just stop. It will stop with our win. Because we have to win, as usual. (laughs) That's so heartwarming. Wow. Her clinic is starting to provide supplies to other clinics that are reopening. So that's encouraging for the animal care in Ukraine. 
But she needs more help, of course. She says there is a network that can bring in supplies from cities in western Ukraine to Kyiv, but she doesn't know how supplies are getting into the country itself. And so if you would like to help and you've been touched by these stories, we have links in today's show notes for this episode with different organizations that are providing assistance. You can also find them on our website at dogedition.com. Claire, this has been such a, a touching, moving, poignant piece, and we've been working on it for a number of weeks. This is the type of journalism that we hope to share with as many dog lovers around the world. So if you are listening to this and thinking, I want to tell other dog lovers about this, well, then please do. Absolutely. Uh, We have a 101 Dog Stories competition at the moment where we are actively seeking audio pieces about different dog-related stories. So you can find out more information about that on our website. And don't forget as well, do follow along to Dog Edition on your favourite podcast app. And if you found today's story moving, don't forget to tell other people about it. If you're out in the dog park having a walk, share it with one of your fellow dog lovers. It helps our programme grow. I'm Claire Mansell in Ottawa, Canada. And I'm James Jacobson here in Maui, Hawaii. Thank you for listening today. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.